Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to this uh, pre or after lunch, post lunch uh, talk. Please don't fall asleep. I hope it's exciting. Hopefully, you can stay awake. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm Chris. I work for Apple as a software engineer, and I'm joined with. Uh, I'm Eric. I'm also a software engineer over at Apple. <laughs> cool. Uh, as you can see, we're going to be talking about Kata containers and uh, virtual cluster. We're not really going to touch on Cluster API, but that's basis. The, the basis for this is all being provisioned through Cluster API. So to get us started, we are in the multi-tenancy track right now. So as I'm going to just make an assumption that all of you are interested in running multi-tenant Kubernetes. Uh, if not, hopefully it's still interesting to you. But as everybody here knows, multi-tenancy in Kubernetes is it's hard. It's not easy. There's a lot of steps that you need to do. And realistically, out of the box, it just doesn't work. Uh, there's a lot of pieces that you want to use as a user of Kubernetes that just aren't accessible. And to make this even harder, hard multi-tenancy, actual isolation of workloads, is very difficult on top of that. And this is all based on the, the amount of attack vectors that Kubernetes has and the difference between the access levels that a data plane has versus a control plane and the pieces that are attached to a control plane that you have access to when you get something like cluster admin. Uh, this talk is going to be split into two sections. We're going to first start, talk about uh, control plane multi-tenancy, and then we're going to talk about data plane multi-tenancy, and then we're going to talk about uh, some, some improvements that we've done uh, or features that we've added to Kata recently to make that multi-tenant story even more advanced uh, in Kubernetes itself. So to get us started, we're going to first talk about multi-tenant control planes. And there's a bunch of tools in this space these days to do this. And we're only going to focus on one. Uh, it's one that I'm a maintainer for. It's called Virtual Cluster. There's another project called vCluster that you could use some of these same exact technologies and tools to, to implement with that. Um, lots of other tools in this space as well. So before we get started on that, we're going to first talk about some issues that you have running multi-tenant control planes itself. One of the biggest things that you run into, or I hope a lot of you have run into, is clumsy and thrashy clients. This is something that, like, if you have a Kubernetes API server, you expose it to a bunch of different tenants, they're going to do things that you don't want. And things like not setting resource version zero uh, and getting basically direct etcd hits on, say, for instance, a pod list. Maybe in a 2,000 pod namespace where it's just having to do the JSON serialization, it's hitting etcd, it's causing a lot of churn, and in, in essence, causing problems for other tenants through those, uh, through those requests. And so in this example, we're basically just saying three tenants doing this pod list and basically hammering etcd, causing problems for other tenants, and in essence, taking down that single, that single control plane from that standpoint. On top of that, users these days, as Kubernetes has become this base platform that we can build platforms on top of, they want access to all of it. And out of the box, you can't do this. You can't add uh, namespace access to just any random tenant without a lot of controls around it, without figuring out how to uh, implement like custom APIs to make all of that possible. Things like HNC that you could throw in here to do this. But out of the box, it's just not very, it's not very possible. And when you layer those, those technologies on top, you end up in a space that isn't exactly Kubernetes. You end up then in a place where you can't do cloud native tools. Things like normal CI CD tools that want access to the entire cluster or multiple namespaces or the ability to, to create a whole namespace to deploy like a red green uh, deployment or a blue green deployment. Um, and so you end up in this place where it's just hard to implement these strategies. I hope that's things that you all have actually uh, experienced as well. Now, in talking about isolating these, Again, this is only one strategy to do it. There's many here behind this, but this is one strategy that, that we have been working on for a bit, uh, which is running virtual cluster. And I'm going to talk high level. I'm not going to go into the in-depth of this because this is, in essence, rehashing a talk from uh, Fei Guo from Alibaba, or now at Microsoft, um, who, who did a presentation about this in 2020 in KubeCon. Um, but in essence, what we're talking about here is taking Kubernetes and throwing it on that pink box on the side and calling it a super cluster. And then taking Kubernetes API servers, controller managers, and etcd instances that are dedicated to tenants and running those as pods inside that cluster or even outside of that cluster, but just those pieces. So you'll notice that there's not a scheduler there. But then you deploy two more main components, that VC syncer up, up at the top and VC manager. Uh, VC manager is behind the scenes what's actually orchestrating, creating those control planes uh, along with cluster API. And the VC syncer is sitting there 
as a multi-tenant uh, uh, scheduler that listens to all tenant control planes and takes pod schedulable resources and syncs them down to the supercluster. So this is going to be a massive piece of work, but it's in essence the same amount of work that the, the normal cube scheduler has to do, but just augmented by different control planes now. And then on top of that, at the node level, because we're talking about data plane isolation in a bit, there's a, a handful of pieces that are important. That green box, or I guess technically all the green boxes, are virtual cluster. And there's a piece in there called VN agent, or virtual node agent. And this is an on-node on agent that acts as a proxy that takes in requests from each one of those tenant API servers. There's a lot behind this. I don't expect you to understand all of these pieces, but if you're interested, phase talk goes really deep into it, and it's, it's a fantastic uh, deep dive. Behind the scenes, the rest of it, the blue boxes are all Kubernetes bits that we all know and use, CRIs, kubelets, so on and so forth. And we got workloads that come from those tenant control planes. But at the end of the day, uh, a user of this system would talk to one of those dedicated control planes, tenant A, tenant B, or tenant C, and they would end up as pod schedulable resources in that lower level cluster. Now what, what this actually looks like behind the scenes is something like this. So imagine you have a massive cloud of infrastructure and you want to leverage that, and you want to start bin packing workloads into it, and you ha now have something like tenant A, B, and C, and you can even have things like a malicious tenant and a clumsy tenant all talking to their own API servers, and those workloads are then getting scheduled down into the supercluster, but all of that's isolated. So any of those interactions, and we're only talking about the, data, or the control plane here, all of those interactions are isolated. So if somebody goes and says, is the clumsy client and does massive pod list, they don't affect anybody but themselves because it's just hitting their etcd instance. They're not then causing problems for everybody else. Or that malicious tenant that's trying to do something bad, we actually have pieces in the sinker that will allow us to stop pods from being scheduled if we don't want them to, uh, for whatever reason. Pod security policies, for example, that they can't change, again, being a cluster level resource. Yes, pod security policies are going away, but there's other resources that are like it. I forget what it's called. Uh, so anyways. This then takes your infrastructure and allows you to start bin packing it in a much denser way. So you can say, if you look at this and say that that first node or that first rack now has some workloads from the malicious tenant, the, the clumsy tenant, and that tenant A. And this can be done with anything from run C to Kata to Gvisor, any of those stacks under the hood. But we can get some benefits out of actually working on the data plane and making it more isolated. So to go back to this, the issues that we have with multi-tenant control planes, when we inject something like virtual cluster or V cluster, since it has a very similar architecture, you're going to get rid of those clumsy, or you can solve the clumsy clients, because they're not going to affect anybody. Worst case scenario, they're hurting themselves, which is really not, not as bad as hurting the rest of the system. That's really what we're trying to protect against. You then get access to cluster level resources, because you have cluster admin to that tenant control plane, and it doesn't, all those resources don't end up in the super cluster. And then you can also use all of those cloud native tools like you normally would. Any of the operators that you want to deploy, things like crossplane you could deploy into this because you have cluster admin capabilities and you can deploy cluster scoped resources. But that only solves half the problem. Now we need to talk about workload isolation. Sweet. So uh, pretending I am an infrastructure provider at this point in the context of this conversation. Basically, we're doing a remote code execution as a service. And it's not that I'm doing that. I'm doing it for multiple uh, end users. Um, if we're to look at the most basic level, people want to be able to run their workload on a machine. And because we do multi-tenancy, you can both run on the same exact machine. Um, and they're just a process running on the host, running on a host Linux kernel on your one node, one of many nodes where they're all running. We're going to use containers because we want to have a view that they're the only thing running on the machine and that it's constrained appropriately. There's no denial of service between workloads, everything else. So these are great features of the Linux kernel using namespaces, using C groups, judiciously picking what capabilities are appropriate for the workload, filtering out different syscalls, things like that. Um, and and it, it works pretty well. The concern from a security perspective is that this is a single interface. Um, so all of these capabilities are based out of the host kernel. Um, so if you do have a zero day and any kind of privilege escalation, you are now root on the host. Me as a provider, that's concerning. Um, but you, uh, as maybe one of many tenants on that node, should be pretty concerned about this as well. Um, so mutually entrusting tenants, yeah, that's, that's bad for them uh, in that case. So we have different options here. The first option is essentially YOLO, like 
the security profile that we have, like what is the cost of an escape? It's pretty low cost if we don't have very sensitive information. If the tenants kind of do trust each other a little bit, um, it doesn't matter. Don't pay the cost for extra isolation. Um, we're talking about hard multi-tenancy, so that, that's out. Um, the other option you have is don't run multiple workloads from different tenants on the same node. So give everybody a different node pool. This has a challenge. Um, one, you can have fragmentation of resources where two tenants, one of them uses 100% of their capacity, another one uses 5%. That's, that's uh, unfortunate. Two, if you do have an escape infrastructure provider, that's concerning. Um, I don't have two layers of isolation anymore. Um, also, if you have an escape and yeah, you're, you're stuck on your one Kubernetes worker node, but a worker node has a lot of um, capabilities as far as authorization to Kubernetes APIs, as well as whatever the network has access to. So for this, we're gonna say that's, that's not quite enough. Um, and we're gonna look at providing stronger workload isolation. So let's have two layers of isolation. And kind of in Kubernetes um, and container area, we, we call this like generally sandboxed runtimes, um, being that we have two layers of isolation. A good example is Gvisor for this. Another one, since we're talking about Kata, you can guess it, is we're gonna be talking about Kata containers. So in the example, going from a traditional container uh, on, on, on that side, I guess it's your left side, um, versus the right-hand side, with Kata containers, we launch a minimal virtual machine, uh, so one layer, hardware virtualization, and then within that, on a guest Linux kernel, they then, uh, we're creating uh, regular containers using namespace, cgroups, all the things. Second layer of isolation, the guest kernel. Um, a touch more detail, what that ends up looking like, kubelet talks to container D or cryo, talks to a task shim uh, below that, so like a kata shim, or it could be traditionally like a run C one, or it could be anything really. In the case of Kata, what we do is we work with a virtual machine monitor, um, so maybe like a QMU, a cloud hypervisor, to launch that minimally configured uh, virtual machine. Little Linux kernel boots up, user space init process will be this Kata agent who actually manages the life cycle of the container itself inside the guest. Um, we'll talk about these little components a little bit, and that's why I'm kind of introducing it. On the bottom, there's way too much information you shouldn't care about, other than to know that networking just works. <laughs> Usually, you drop a VETH into a network namespace. We then, uh, all traffic is piped directly into the guest such that the container workload has access to it without any configuration necessary. And then we can get into how we can leverage these things to come together. Cool. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so virtual cluster introduces one thing, which I left completely out until we got to this. Out of the box, Kubernetes does one thing that is kind of odd. Uh, in essence, services, because they're a virtual component, are actually allocated, the IPs from them are allocated from a CIDR range that's hard-coded into the API server flags. So you set that, and it basically gets allocated. Now, if we go back, if you think back to that, that diagram before, you in essence have three tenants talking to another tenant. What tenants are you supposed to basically make those, those service IPs routable from? Uh, that's the space where things start to break down. And so uh, we got together and basically tried to figure out how we can make this all possible using Kata under the hood. And that's what we're going to dive into. So again, this is that architecture. Imagine those three tenants. Those service, those service cluster IP ranges that are in those API server flags, those are allocating the uh, routable IP addresses for them. And they can be overlapping, 192.168 slash uh, 32, right? So we're going from there, and we're punching that into the supercluster, which now has a completely different range, or potentially overlapping, and you can cause a lot of problems. So what we started to do, and I'll walk through a quick little uh, like breakdown of this, is we're going to talk through Andrea up in the corner, coming through and creating a pod against the tenant API server. Uh, Andrea is a, a, a decent client, not going to cause too many problems for us, but it's going to go and create a pod. And to walk through how all of this stuff functions and what we've added to make this possible is at the same time when that pod gets created in the API server, we actually have an instance of kube proxy running alongside that. This is in a Kata container that's considered a privileged Kata container for the control plane. And it has a one single sidecar along with it, so we're not making any changes to any of that core code base. And that's called the exporter. And the exporter sits there and it says, hey, I got an update in my IP tables. I need to do something. Now, that's jumping ahead a little bit, because at this point, 
virtual cluster, like uh, the architecture that I was showing before, is actually syncing that pod object down into the API server, and it's doing its normal Kubernetes bits, hitting, hitting the kubelet, or the kubelet's getting a notification saying, oh, I gotta schedule this workload. It hits container D or cryo, it schedules the pod, uh, and it creates that entire space. In this world, now we're showing a Kata workload running there rather than something like run C. So going back to kube proxy over here, whee, I'm gonna use some fun things, whoo, there. Kube proxy over here, we're actually going to get an update on that, and we're gonna push IP tables rules back into the API server. Now, some of this is a little bit, uh, it's not the most scalable architecture as it currently stands, and we'll talk about that in, the, uh, in a couple slides later, but right now what we're doing is basically taking those IP tables, syncing them up to the tenant control plane, saying, hey, this, this tenant has this set of IP tables, and I want you to apply that to every single workload that it has. Now, I talked about this VN agent before, being an on-node agent, that basically takes in those, those IP tables, and it says, hey, Kadashim, set these, because this is that same tenant. So now we have per-tenant IP table rules that are getting pushed to every single workload that it goes alongside. So if you repeat that as an entire process, you're pushing a new set of rules into those, uh, into those Kata containers so that it has that new space. And this creates a routable service cluster IP range, oh, I forgot one last slide, which is it pushing through the Kadashim to the Kata agent and pushing the rules in. Yeah. And at that point, yeah, if you're in one of these tenants, we'll show you a little bit deeper dive of that. So imagine now we have two nodes, back in that example, and we have two different Kata uh, workloads running. One's at 10.0.0.1 and 10.1.0.1, uh, and those are on some random node IPs that we don't really care about in this one. Say you're coming from that one where we're doing that curl to the foo service. This is a, one of those things that gets pushed into the IP tables rules. This is actually now taking 192.168 uh, 220 and saying, hey, I gotta figure out where to route this. Now in the Kata guest, we can actually do IP tables denatting to that 10101, and then it just hits host networking, goes across, and lands in that actual workload. Uh, yeah, so quick demo of how this all functions, and then I'll come back to that slide just to give you a little bit of a refresher. And this is all recorded, because I am not gonna do this live. So this is gonna go through and do exactly what we're talking about. I'll show you the deployments here just to show what a cluster's like to create. So if we actually look at this, this is what a virtual cluster spec looks like. Am I doing time-wise? Okay, so that's what a virtual cluster spec looks like that you go create this cluster. You have a cluster domain in there that gets pushed into things like core DNS that you'll see deployed and some other flags that don't really matter for this demo. I think that started. Cool. So. This is now gonna go, and it's gonna go VC, it's gonna use a kube CTL uh, virtual cluster plugin that allows it to actually write out a kube config for this tenant control plane specifically. So it's gonna bring up an etcd instance. Remember I was telling you before, it only brings up a couple components. So it brings up the, the etcd instance, the API server, and the controller manager. The cluster is now created, and now we have access to it. And just to show this is what a kube config looks like for one of these tenant control planes, looks something like this. Um, we're redacting all the certificate data and all of that. And maybe I can speed this up. From here. I'm still nervous, I know it's recorded, but. Yeah, still. I, guess I should probably speed this up. But anyways, we're gonna now show you what that virtual cluster looks like. So if you kubectl get all-a, so all namespaces, this is all you see. And I'm gonna do one more time where I'm actually hitting the super cluster just to give you a, the difference. So we're talking to a tenant control plane running in the cluster that I'm now hitting, which has all of these resources. And there's a bunch of pieces here that are, that are important uh, that I'll show later, but in essence, we now have uh, a couple new namespaces. So that default dash with a hash VC sample one, that's the cluster name and the prefixed namespaces. And this is how we can basically create namespaces on behalf of users in a lower level super cluster and isolate them. So we prefix all those namespaces. If you have long namespaces, this is always a question that gets asked. Uh, if you have long namespaces, it truncates it for you, but still makes it uh, uh, unique. So we're gonna clear that up so we get it back up to the top. And now we're gonna go and we're gonna deploy something into that cluster. First thing we're gonna do is deploy core DNS, because who needs a cluster if you don't have DNS in there? And what's important about this is those namespace prefixes that I just showed, those are actual parts of the FQDN uh, when you're in a cluster. And so we need this because we configure this uh, core DNS instance as the name server on every single pod that comes from your tenant control plane. So everybody has their own isolated DNS servers. You can set that to, to resolve to whatever behind the scenes you want. Again, I'm gonna show you the difference in clusters. So what's cool here is I'm gonna highlight that there's replica sets and deployments, but nothing from that tenant. 
And this is why we deploy a controller manager, because we only care about pod schedulable resources. We can take that and say, once the controller manager and the tenant scheduled it or created a pod for it, we'll take that and push it into the cluster. Now, the super cluster becomes a pod scheduling domain and allows us to scale that even uh, wider. And I missed talking about it, but it showed the pod up at the top with its dash default namespace. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to deploy a Kata workload. Uh, and this actually isn't calling out Kata in here uh, from a runtime class standpoint, because what we've done is to make it extra secure, you don't even have to set a runtime class. We inject that automatically. You deploy a pod like a normal Kubernetes deployment, and it ends up in Kata behind the scenes. And what I'm deploying here is two different applications, PHP, Apache, because we all love PHP, right? Right? Cool. And uh, a networking pod so we can actually do some tests, and one service so we can actually do some uh, uh, routing test in the actual cluster. I, no, I'll leave it alone. I'm going to speed it up. I, want to, I think I could probably speed this up a little bit. So now we're going to go get pods and services in that tenant control plane, show that those things were created, and show the service cluster IPs. So you'll notice here that we have 10.32.01 uh, for the Kubernetes service, 10.32.0106. That's allocated from the tenant control plane on the services. And then those IPs for the pods are that 192.168 range. That's exposed via the supercluster. So in this world right now, uh, we have routable pod ranges. Uh, and we expect things like CNIs to do uh, zero trust out of the box at that standpoint. Now you'll see in the tenant control plane, same IPs for the pods, but different IPs for the actual supercluster services. So these are here, but they're non-routable from the, the tenant standpoint. Now if we go and say exec into this pod, and we hit IP table save just to show what's happening, and I'm going to use default Kubernetes just to show what's actually happening. So this wrote a rule into that Kata container that is that 10.32.01 range, not the super clusters range, uh, with the comments about that kubeproxy normally injects. And I'll do a couple more tests in here just to show, show how things function. So in here we're going to do... Uh, using that, using one of the actual uh, PHP applications, we're going to grab the pod IP and we're going to try and route to it, which is going to go and hit uh, the same route, the same networking stack under the hood. And so we'll do exec, and we'll use that networking pod again, and we're going to, oh, we're going to grep for that one to see how that actually translates in there. And you'll see that this is uh, a destination mapping to that 192 range. I'm not showing that cubes uh, sep actual definition, but in essence, that's the, it's the same as that 1032 range that's exposed at the tenant control plane. Continuing this through, we're now going to curl that, and we're going to curl the Kubernetes service, and I'm just going to hit the health endpoint because I'm unauthorized anyways. And so this is hitting the DNS server inside the cluster because we configure the name servers automatically for you on every single pod, and that hits your tenant control plane, not the super cluster. No, it doesn't ever hit any of those services that are exposed at the lower level. And then we're going to try one more thing. We're going to grab the service cluster IP of that Kubernetes service, do the exact same request slash to that health endpoint. Again, this is not routable in the super cluster. If I went to one of those nodes and tried to curl this, it wouldn't work. And I'm getting that health uh, OK endpoint. And we're going to do a couple more tests in here because it gets fun. We're going to do networking. We're going to curl the PHP application on default. And that's going to return back OK bang. Yeah. And we're going to do one more time where we go and do the exact same thing, where we grab the service cluster IP. And then we'll do one more test after that just to show all these things working, where we grab the, uh, the actual IP of the pod. Cool. So now we have that 1032 range. We'll curl that. And OK, bang. Boom. Sweet. Okay, so now we basically are showing that this is now a new routable range for all these pods. Uh, we're going to do one more test, which is, again, that uh, IP address that we had above. So we showed this IP address before, but this is that test networking pod. One more time getting an OK bang. Yes. Sweet. So now we're actually able to hit the pods directly if we want to. And then we're going to do one other thing, which is, I think, an interesting layering of the architectures here. So now I can take this load balancer service. So if you noticed before when I was talking about that virtual cluster, this is on, uh, on AWS. We have the Cloud Controller Manager deployed for AWS configured. 
But because we do dual services, when we actually deploy this, we can leverage the platform to actually expose things at a platform level. So if you wanted to do a platform level ingress, for example, you can do that kind of function, or in this one, a type load balancer, that's gonna go and actually create an ELB and attach it to the same cert, to the same pods that are in the cluster and be routable as a, a platform level load balancer rather than having each tenant need to own those type of tools. So you can layer this and build, build uh, pieces that are in essence invisible to the user but act kind of like magic. Now I sped this up like crazy because if you've used uh, AWS, you know that these ELBs aren't immediately routable and I'm gonna pause it because it goes back and that is the piece. So now we're basically curling that ELB endpoint and being able to get that okay bang. Woo! So going back to the slides, I think I'm getting close on time. Going back to the slides real quick. This is showing that entire same structure. So behind the scenes, when you deploy any of those pods or any of those services, this entire flow is, is happening uh, behind the scenes for you. Pushing those IP tables rules into the Kata uh, containers and making them all routable. Now, in talking about the future, and this is where I was saying that this isn't the most scalable architecture. If you remember, I don't know, 116 days with things like IP tables, the amount, of, uh, the amount of network traffic that goes through each time one of these things is updating, it's a lot. It's an absolute lot. Luckily, the community actually started this. Uh, we learned about this after we started this project or after we pretty much finished this project. There's a new piece of work coming uh, that is still a cap, but it's called Kaping. Uh, and Kaping is at sigs.ks.io slash kpng. And this is the new node group proxy or an NG proxy. And this allows you to actually set up a network control plane, which every single workload or every single node at that point would then have a network agent rather than using something like the VN agent or, uh, or any of the CNIs. It then gets all, or sorry, cube proxy. Uh, what it's gonna do is it's going to actually have a gRPC connection back to that network control plane. Uh, so our long-term plans are to integrate with this instead because we can actually do really interesting things like pushing single rules through because that's a piece that they in, they've started to implement in, in the Kaping world rather than pushing the entire IP rules set. Uh, there's also a bunch of syncs that they're calling it uh, behind the scenes on the, node, on the node agent side where you can do push it straight into eBPF and all of that stuff. It's a really, really cool project if you haven't heard about it. Um, again, still in a kept phase, but could be very cool for, for Kubernetes to remove some of those big pains that we have with uh, proxy. And then the last thing, now I talked about this being hard multi-tenancy. We're getting closer. We're not entirely there. Those, po those pods are still routable on the cluster. And you expect something to have like a zero trust network out of the box. That is the one piece of this that we're still, that we want to still get to, and that's gonna come in another KubeCon talk, so. And this is the end, so yeah. Please provide feedback if you have any questions. We're happy to, unless we don't have time. I don't know. I don't know. How one question. Hey, this was really cool. Um, so you showed the the routing with the IP tables and everything. I just curious. Um, service meshes are obviously huge. Is this something that would work with meshes out of the box? And um, if so, what about like if your tenants uh, want to use meshes inside their virtual clusters? Yep. So they could actually technically run, uh, as long as they have the privileges to be able to access that guest OS, they could technically run a service mesh in there uh, and do some of those same functions. The pieces where service meshes don't allow us to do the same type of function is um, the way that the informers work for those types of interactions uh, and are set up to, to talk to a Kubernetes API server. Out of the box, they're gonna talk to the super cluster. And so you have to break that down. So there's a little bit of work to make that possible. But with this architecture, you could just layer a service mesh on top of it um, and allow that to function. So you could have like Linkerd and Istio in the same cluster at that point. So. Thanks, awesome talk. Um, so the second part of the talk is pretty much about um, the techniques that you use to isolate the, the workloads in that uh, big uh, data plane, right? But that's only a problem that you need to solve because you are with the big cluster approach that uh, it has the super cluster with the the massive shared data plane. So you could have done something different, like you mentioned a few options at the beginning, maybe have some hosted control planes in a managed cluster and then have completely separate and dedicated data planes for each of them, like whatever. So can you talk a little bit uh, about how, like why you choose the big cluster approach and how, how it's uh, a good fit for your scenario against yeah. different options? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so why virtual cluster is a, a, a good use case to actually leverage? Um, control planes can be expensive. Uh, especially if you live in a in a on-premise world where you're deploying into bare metal hosts, uh, it's a very expensive thing. And so, being able to layer this architecture allows you to build massive clusters that you support at that level, uh, and then s smaller, more single-purpose uh, control planes that you can easily isolate. Um, that's pretty much the big piece behind this. Um, there's other there's other tools like. The where this originally came from, uh, from the folks at Alibaba, it allows them to do this sort of isolation in their massive multi-tenant uh, environments. So. Cool. Hey, um, two questions. Um, starting with um, the V cluster. Um, so once you set up V cluster, you know you think all your problems are solved. You can give it to your customers and like, hey, you have basically your own Kubernetes cluster, do whatever you want. Two minutes later, they're going to go and try to deploy Prometheus stack or the NVIDIA DCGM exporter or something like that that requires a daemon set with host access. And they're going to be really annoyed and said, hey, you didn't give me a true, uh, true Kubernetes cluster. I wonder if uh, both with and without CATA containers, you have been doing any work around that. Like if you say that you run with CATA containers and you really would need to schedule that pod inside the same container as the workload is running to be able to extract metrics for that workload. The same goes with like log collection, fluent bit and that type of stuff. Yeah, I'm sort of struggling. Can you, can you help me? With, yeah. Help me a little bit with what you're, what you're trying to get to. So I'm trying to, to get to, you know, if users want to run their own, say, Prometheus instance, they're going to want to run their own node exporter. And you can't, obviously can't let them run that on, um, gotcha. on the bare metal host because that's where everything runs. And then do you, do you provide any facility for them to run that inside gotcha. the CATA container, gotcha. the same container that their other workloads are running in? Not as of now. Yeah. Uh, that's something you could potentially do. Um, it's just something we haven't we haven't looked at. And we are doing things uh, that we haven't pushed up yet, but we are actively talking with the rest of the, the folks on virtual cluster around how to expose metrics better, but not node level metrics. Um, yeah. So like not not NPD or like yeah node problem and detector. And what, what do you do like with that. kind of logging? Like how do people get uh, get logging if they can't deploy their own like fluent bit daemon sets and that type of stuff? Yeah. Uh, so out of the box, which you uh, you get access to logs through normal like. Through that VN agent, it's basically a proxy that allows you to get to the to the actual logs on, the, on an individual container. It injects the prefixes, which is what keeps it so that you can't talk to another tenant's workloads. Um, for running things like a daemon set that has uh, a logging agent out of the box into it, that's something that we don't have yet. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can run your own logging agent and yeah. collect that on the, on their behalf and do some multi-tenancy there. I guess exactly. which is the same thing that we do. The next question is around performance in CATA containers. Yeah. Uh, now, I haven't looked at CATA containers in a while, but both, both in terms of kind of GPU pass-through and storage, it, it looked like it would have a lot of overhead, like the CATA container way of doing storage pass-through with Vertio FS seemed very unoptimized um, at least a while back. There's actually a wonderful talk on Friday afternoon, like when everyone else is gone almost, like a good yes. talk right around then about how to mitigate the cost of shared file system performance. Okay, guess I need to uh, change my flight. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, so, so but, it, but I mean, basically to be, I mean, best case scenario, your provider has some kind of direct uh, assigned storage. Um, but in Yeah, case, so you would mount it inside a CATA container with like NFS or something like that. Yeah, that or um, to be able to do direct assignment of the black device itself. So a lot yeah, of times you end up creating a black device, attaching it to a host, yeah. mounting it, passing that mount into it, and it's just a little bit extra. If you can actually just only do the mounts inside the guest and you're dealing with it at a block Yeah, block volume, system, it's, it's better. It's still much not better as great performance, as but it still is, yeah. Uh, what, what type of applications do you guys use this for? Like, do you use it for any high performance applications like neural net training? I mean, it's up to the end, end user. It's, it's, it's a variety, yep. um, including, you know, if you look at different database applications, things like this. So you don't, you, you, the, the, um, you, you consider the performance acceptable for like all types of use cases? Um, in our specific instances, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I haven't had any issues in our particular, but really it varies very much depending on your end user and yep. particularly what they're looking at. Cool, thank you. Yeah, great presentation. We have one minute left, so if any quick questions. Any other last minute thoughts? Or comments? Comments, yeah. You can also f file feedback right here. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Oh, we got one more. Yeah. Oh, 
So I, I see that you're using Kata containers for the workloads, uh, but have you thought about using Kata containers to isolate the control planes? And why, why wouldn't you or why would you? Uh, in this world, behind the scenes, these are actually being deployed into Kata containers. We're just not talking about oh, that, okay. that piece. Um, under the hood, because those are being deployed into one or many of those uh, super clusters that are configured as like the default runtime classes being set to MicroVM, it's just automatically deploying. Uh, we're just not calling it out in the slides. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, as well, there's some Kata stickers up here if you all want to mm -hmm. uh, after. I don't know if there's enough for everybody, but there's some. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank